subject. Drought, and it's about drought and agriculture. Climate stress is intensifying summer drought conditions and water stress. Farmers in the Comox Valley have been among the first to have their livelihoods impacted by water stress and water license restrictions. What should the province do to, to enact preventative, equitable water policy that ensures ecosystem protection as well as food production? I guess, okay, so it's time to talk, okay. <laughs> all right, well, I, I'm Ronna Ray Leonard. Can you hear me all right? Okay, and uh, I am the BCNDP candidate. I've been uh, a representative of Courtney Comox since 2017, and uh, I've, at one point I had the opportunity to be the Parliamentary Secretary for Agriculture, and it was a... Uh, exciting time and also a bit different from where we're at now but one of the things that's happened at the very beginning of uh, our, our government was the Minister of Agriculture really jumped in with with all of her fervor to develop a whole program of called Buy BC, Feed BC and Grow BC. I'm never sure about the actual uh, uh, order of those things but that encompasses all that there is to be able to support agriculture here in the Comox Valley and across the province. A lot of attention had been paid in the past to uh, agriculture, like agribusiness, agri to move things offshore. And there was a, a real concerted effort to be supporting of more local. And nothing, nothing became more clear about that need than when we had wildfires and communities were cut off and during COVID when the supply chain became a big issue. So it's really important that we continue to focus heavily on developing our agricultural sector in a way that is, is going to work for British Columbians and work for the farmers. Now the issue here is around drought and, and climate stress. Climate stress comes both ends of the spectrum. We've had floods down in the Fraser Valley, and we've had drought, particularly there's two watersheds that have had drought, one of them being the Solom River watershed. And two years ago, there was a, a, a fish protection order that was put into place, and there was a, a, an examination of where the most water was being used and where it could be curtailed while we got through those few weeks in towards the end of summer to make sure that, that, that we had the, the water that was necessary for fish. And what ended up happening was there was a 42 or 47 uh, farmers who watered their forage crops. And that was a very heavy use of water and it was determined that that was one thing that should be curtailed. But at the same time, you, they have livestock that needs to be fed. So we engaged with the, the Cattlemen's Association who coordinated getting hay and feed to, to the farmers that were here locally. So that precipitated a lot of work around drought in the Ministry of Agriculture. And so where we're at now is in 2020, in the, within this last year, originally there was a, three different um, programs that were put into place to try and support uh, farmers on, on the farm uh, and small scale in, infrastructure as well as um, bigger infrastructure. And, that $20,000 was subscribed, oversubscribed immediately. And it was obvious that there was a greater need. And so the, there was a, another offering of up to $80 million. So $100 million towards drought, trying to deal with drought in, in our province within the farming sector. And it is, it is a challenge. Water. I used to work in water conservation education, didn't I, Judy? One minute remaining. One minute. <laughs> and 
the permitting process came under the Water Sustainability Act back uh, well in the previous government before we took office and there has been serious challenges in getting it um, put into place to to be effective and it is a challenge for uh, the farmers still and that's where I think that there's opportunities for us to do better and to do more to make sure that we're supporting the, the farmers to be able to water their crops to provide the food and, and to make sure that, that we're doing it in a way that respects all of the environment that we have to, to, that feeds us. So the big issue around fish protection is it's number one. Um, the fish come with nutrients and energy from the sea and feed the land and that feeds us. And so we have to uh, pay attention to the, the ways that we, that we work with the land and work with the water. Boy, that was good timing. <laughs> Second question tonight comes from the Comarcelli Social Planning Society. The, qu the current earnings exemption limit for those receiving benefits from the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction does not meet the needs of people receiving the benefits and it is unnecessarily bureaucratic in practice. If elected, what would you do, do to support the call from 50 nonprofit leaders, advocates, and community partners in the anti-poverty and disability rights sectors to abolish the earnings exemption limit for people receiving income assistance, including those with persistent and multiple barriers and those with, sorry, those who are receiving people with disabilities benefits. Okay, all right, okay. Now, on to a different subject. <laughs> um, I think the, the issue that we're, we're dealing with here is a, a, a few things. Um, the, the disability benefits has, when we took office, was incredibly low. There were clawbacks. Um, I remember there was a $50 increase and the, the minister at the time was saying they should come back and ask for more. And we came into office and increased the disability benefits. And we've increased them five times in the term, our term of office did a big bump for, for during COVID, which came off at the end of COVID. Um, and we've increased the exemption limit so that people can earn more. I was on the finance committee at one point when this young woman with disabilities came in and year after year she was asking for um, an increase in the exemption to be able to not be forced into poverty because of her disability. That she needed the supports that she needed because of her disability, but she wanted to be able to earn and make a good living. And she was an artist. And, and uh, so I know that we have continuously said that there's a need for more. There's a need for more. There was a uh, study commissioned about the uh, guaranteed income and uh, I know people want that uh, it's, it's it's a simple answer but it's a very expensive answer and it doesn't always get you to the goals that you want was how the report came out and that there was better ways of going about providing um, the resources to help people to succeed and to not be living in poverty. We do have a, a legislation to try and reduce the, our poverty levels in, in British Columbia and, and so that people aren't living in dire straits. I have, I have family that's on disability and they're always in fear of losing their home. And so I know it's, it's a real challenge and it is something that, that we have to address in an incremental way at this point because um, each time we, we move forward, we learn something new and have to adjust. It's, it's a, an iterative process. To, we have a, a disability uh, advisory group with 11 people, including, I don't know how many of you know Michael McClellan. He's a, a blind advocate 
disabilities advocate and he he has been on it since day one. Uh, I recommended him for it and I was really pleased that he got on it. And Spring Dawes is another person who's the chair and I'm just really amazed at the, the insights that they bring to the work of, of the ministry to make sure that we can move forward and provide the supports and the pathway for so that they can succeed. Work BC is another place where there's always room for, for more. Uh, to, it's called the Work Able Program. It's, it's, these are just some of the things that are, are those streams where we can start to make differences. And we need, definitely need to be um, listening to those voices about what is needed and how to get there. If we don't you know, it's the, nothing about us without us. We need to have, I know that Judy, you've worked in with, with people with disabilities and so has Roz. Would you speak for the benefit of the people here? Would you be able to share the rates, the current rates for like a single person? Yeah, no, I can't actually. I didn't write those down. Too many other m numbers in my head, but I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the issue of, of making employment accessible is another piece of it, where people want to work uh, in whatever capacity they can, whether it's part-time or full-time, in the fields that they choose, and how do we get them through the door. And that's where our accessibility legislation has taken, taken bigger strides, <coughs> providing the supports, the, the, the education to employers about the benefits of hiring people with disabilities and making sure that within government we are, are working to be more accessible and providing those opportunities for equitable employment for everyone. And so that's, those are just some of the things that we've been uh, working on. And as always, there is more to do and we are committed to doing okay, it. Candidates, I didn't time. hear a bell. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question. <laughs> this question comes to us through the Comox Valley, Comox Valley Early Years Collaborative. Given the success of the current Child Care BC plan, including $10 a day child care, and the immense positive impact it has had for families with young children, what do you intend to do to make sure that A, the current plan continues with a dramatic increase in the number of high quality $10 a day spaces, and B, if you have any future plans to include a fair wage grid for early childhood educators, including access to quality post-secondary training? Okay. Well, this one, the, <laughs> when we introduced the child care plan, when the minister came and talked to our caucus, I was in tears because I, this was a game changer. It was going to make a difference in women's lives and families' lives because there was, apart from the, the lack of child care, the cost of child care was astronomical. It could be as much a, a, as somebody's mortgage payments every month and that was a barrier to having people go back to work and and we need those workers so we set about to do the the child care plan which what we inherited was described as a patchwork of of child care and today we are still working to to try to make it streamlined we want it to be a core service that families can rely on just like they rely on k-12 education and working to create a positive environment for people to choose early childhood education as, as a career path. Uh, it's, it has always been low paying and a stepping stone if you get some education to go on to something that's going to be a little more lucrative. Um, you have to respect the, the work that they do and, you, and part of that is to pay them a decent wage. And we started off with uh, $1 and then it was $2 and it's up to $6 more than when they started in 2017. And there's opportunities, of course, for more. One of the things that we want to see is, is quality 
child care and not everybody was trained in the past uh, to, to be licensed in a way that was going to provide that quality of care. One of the big impetuses for change was a little baby named Sam who um, died while he was in child care and, and it was like what, what went wrong and what can we do better. And so in terms of education we've added more child care, early childhood, early child care educators uh, seats uh, including at North Island College and we've created um, the opportunity for people to work and learn. Some people can't afford to go to school um, and lose out on that wage. So trying to make it flexible so that, that people can take courses when they're not working and be able to raise up their skill level so that they can move through to uh, higher levels of care. And right now there's a focus on being able to provide the child care that's necessary for kids with special needs that have special um, the needs for one-on-one. -on -one. Our, our, our sector is in desperate need of more and I know I know that there's a pathway for foreign credential um, to, to come into the country to do childcare. And it's a bit of a challenge. I've heard from some childcare providers that um, there are some challenges, that, that, that some wrinkles in the plot that need to be ironed out because sometimes they're not quite as qualified and carry the same values that we do here in BC and how we, and how we provide childcare. And that's a tough, that's a tough one. Um, but we also have people that are coming in, foreign students who want to learn it, uh, learn how to be early childhood educators. And so the, those are the, oh, the 10 a day, I'll just, well, I've got one minute, so I'm just gonna quickly go on to the 10 a day. Um, that has been our commitment. Uh, we have been working towards creating that universal 10 a day, but some people in the, the um, scheme that we have the, for, for child care rebates for parents has brought $22.4 million uh, into, the Comox, into the Comox Valley parents' pockets. Um, some people don't pay anything, so it's better than 10 a day. Um, but we're, we are working to make sure that everybody can afford to, to put their kids in school and can afford to go to work. We were the first in, BC, in Canada to, have, to move towards that. We're not, see, we've just recently seen the federal government come forward to, to be a part of getting, getting affordable child, accessible, safe child care here in, in British Columbia and across Canada. And it's only one of many programs that we were first in and are getting to. Sorry, can I wrap up your sentence, please? We're going to move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from the Immigrant Welcome Center. Between 2016 and 2021, 775 new immigrants came to the Comox Valley. How do you feel our community is doing in welcoming newcomers? And what recommendation do you or your party have around immigration going forward? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, immigration is a is a key to our success as a province. Uh, we're going to need a million jobs uh, filled within the next ten years, and eighty percent of them have to be um, re will require post secondary education, and that's that's asking a lot. And we just don't have those human resources here. To, to be able to fill all those spots. So um, we know there's been a doctor shortage. We know there's been nurses shortage. There's, there's many shortages. Um, so one of the challenges for immigrants is to be able to get into their field. They, like, like the question says, that, that they are, oh no, I'm reading the next question. <laughs> I read ahead. <laughs> But one of the things, okay, I'll go back to it. The, we'll get to that question later. But one of the things that happens is most immigrants will settle in, in big urban centers. And we have a program with, for 
trying to entice at least entrepreneurs to come into smaller rural areas and set up new businesses so that it feeds the community uh, needs and it also helps them to thrive. That's, that's one of the, ish, the, the programs that we have. Most of, most of immigration issues are uh, federal issues, but we do have immigrant and refugee settlement services that we provide. And I think the, um, the displaced Ukrainians that came really brought to a head the, the need for language skill development. And I know that just in this past year, the Immigrant Welcome Center has doubled their space and we, we provided $85,000 to help them with, with that space to be teaching language. I've met with the, some displaced Ukrainians who are quite frustrated because they're trying to learn the language and there's all kinds of barriers to that. So we're, in terms of foreign credentials, we're trying to, uh, we've, we've introduced um, the, a fast tracking of those foreign credentials and not making them every year prove that they've got the language skills that they had last year. <laughs> and that's one of the things that, yeah. <laughs> so, are we welcoming? I'd like to think we are. I think that we've proven it with the, with the displaced Ukrainians, just how generous people can be. And that has, was really a part of what it made it easy for us as a government to provide more funding because we recognized that there was this generosity of spirit. It, it, was, it was easily... Uh, matched by, by provincial taxpayer dollars because there was proof that that's what people want to do. They want to welcome uh, new people. Do we have problems? You bet. You know, there, are, there are some real challenges. I have um, experience with staff who, who didn't always feel comfortable and that's a societal change. Uh, don't look at people differently, like askance because they wear a hijab. Um, it's, not, it's not easy in a small town. My sister-in-law came to visit once. Uh, for, she's, she's of Indian origin and she said, pretty white bread here. <laughs> Lots of blonde, blue-eyed kids in the, in the playgrounds. And it takes real effort. And we have some incredible organizations here that we support and I would continue to see, uh, make sure that they are supported to help make people feel welcome and that we grow a welcoming community. Uh, grandchildren in the $10 a day. It's making a big difference for grandma. It's really helping. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's really good. Well, good. Can I, can I sneak a quick one in? Sure. Uh, I, I don't know if it's Nova Scotia or, or, or uh, New Brunswick has just introduced um, a plan where uh, child care providers will be on a pension plan and a um, um, medical plan. And, okay. and I don't know whether that's provincially done or it's done through the employer or something like that. but they've sort of made that a part of, right. of, of the, the lower cost but trying to get yes. try to get the the, the, the remuneration up. Okay, right. That's fine. So we're gonna ask him to wrap up the last sentence there. And I could it is that time uh, when we're going to actually ask our candidates to move tables. So again, we're asking the candidates to move and the, electoral, the, the folks that are here to listen to just stay seated so you get a chance to hear all the candidates. I can tell you that um, this is an issue okay, that we've, so we've created as parliamentary two. secretary for non-profit and community three, services, and four. that's one of the big things, is how can Sorry, we create a pension plan for especially low-income people. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, i got to go to one. Where am I going? <laughs> <laughs> Direction. <laughs> Nice to chat, man. It's not a chat. Nice to talk at you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, my dad, can you hear me? Hi, everybody. Where am I? How is it up here? Oh, 
volume's a little bit better. Nice. Okay. <laughs> better than down there, I would say. I'm over a tough audience. <laughs> I will see that. I will see that. Oh. Just need a quick second because we do have to move one camera still. So we're, we're switching up the authors. Hey, while we're waiting, I can give you the the, the opening spiel so that we can because I know we kind of get into the uh, questions really quickly. So for folks who don't know me. It's funny math. Government math. Oh. There's the thing again. This is not an easy, this is, this is a, I can't believe that we're having to have this discussion. Um, it is true that it, it is a question of, oh, this is difficult to hear these folks around me talking. Um, we are under attack in our society with people who have a different way of being and it starts at, in our schools where we have developed and supported SOGI, the sexual orientation and gender identity program to, to teach acceptance and then we have leaders who are totally supporting uh, anti-gay, transphobia, uh, th trying to chase people out of their schools, uh, trying to stigmatize people, just inciting uh, fear in the hearts of people who don't understand, uh, who, who have had no opportunities. I've had this conversation with people on the, street, on, on the doorstep about what, it, what, it, what SOGI means. You know, it means teaching people to be accepting and not bullying of others. I, I don't have hair, I have alopecia. And part of the reason I don't wear a wig is because there is a sense of otherness that we all have and we should all be able to stand freely and in, in an inclusive society. The fear mongering has turned into of, of violence, a, a very big bullying issue. And so we, before we finished our session in the spring, created legislation to create like a bubble zone around schools to prevent people from being able to go and, and, and bang on doors and windows of the schools to harass students, to harass teachers and parents, because this is just not acceptable. 
It's just not acceptable. We have to do whatever we can to be supportive uh, of our children's right to choose and, and be supportive of families to, to be accepting. The, the, the issue of getting over stigma uh, is, is really a difficult one. It's, it, and, and it takes all of us to work together to make sure that people feel, everybody feels safe and, and included in our society so that everybody can prosper. As, as grown-ups, um, the issue around uh, acceptance is really important in terms of employment, in terms of uh, gaining health care access, whatever. And so we've created a gender equity office so that government services have to um, look through a, a gendered lens to make sure that we're not biased and so that and creating equitable opportunities for people to join and be a part of, of government. And it starts with those kinds of institutions to help change people's minds and hearts around, around what is acceptable and what is not. We are in a time of great fear for many people. And it's not, it's, it is, um, it feels criminal to me that we should, that we should be having to, to fight against this. I thought we were in a better place in our society and we're not. And we're not, if this, can, this fear mongering can generate more, more anger and, and a lack of acceptance and, and violence, and violence too. It's not that long ago that we were hearing, and we still hear about trans people being injured and killed. When did that become acceptable? And that's what's being promoted by one of the parties that's not here tonight and I'm not supposed to be negative but I'm going to say that you got to know you got to know that it could be your child it could be your your brother it could be anybody that you know that is is going to become a target and we can't let that happen does anybody want to say something about it some of the questions which was um, what would you do if like your party put forward like anti LGBT well we never would we have worked yeah. very hard yeah. yeah we would never we would never do we're gonna move to the next and, question. okay okay I'm sorry I gotta go on to the okay, next, so the next <laughs> question thank you for that it's coming to us from the Comox Valley Coalition to End Homelessness and here's the question uh, it's about the affordable housing gap. So even quote unquote affordable housing options often remain out of reach for many who are the most vulnerable. What specific policies or programs would you support in order to support those who can't afford existing affordable housing options? Okay. Well, <laughs> In 2017, we inherited a huge infrastructure deficit in housing. The marketplace was supposed to be able to provide those solutions. We had rent increases allowed at inflation plus 2%. One of the first things we did was take away that extra 2%. It's not a, a, the be all and end all to, to stop the, the rising rents, but it, it makes a difference, especially over time. And at one point we even froze them, the, the rents. And when inflation was sky high, we, we capped it at a lower amount. That's one of the things that we did with existing stock. Um, we also created a, an affordable housing plan that has seen a thousand units either built or in progress here in the Comox Valley and, and many thousands more, t tens of thousands more throughout British Columbia. There's a, a program and where we've seen it here in the Comox Valley is uh, the Wache Friendship Centre has got 40 units that's coming on stream in the, by the, before the end of the year. We just opened 48 units of 
permanent housing for women and children and, and gender diverse people fleeing vi domestic violence. Uh, we have uh, just opened earlier this year Cypress Gardens which is 52 units for seniors and people with disabilities. The formula for those are it's called the 50-30-20 split. So 50% of the units are at, at rent geared to income. Then there is uh, the 30% that is at, at social assistance rates. And then there's the 20% that are at 10% below market rates. So that it, it gets a range of incomes who can live together and not create uh, uh, I don't want to say ghettos, but, but to, to put people together in one, one uh, area without, it's, it's a way of creating diversity and, and a place for everyone. Is it enough? No, we need to build a whole lot more. And one of the wonderful things about this community is there's great leadership and there's great capacity in organizations. All of those organizations that I just met, all of those housing initiatives I just mentioned are have been initiated by local organizations, different local organizations. And I'm on the finance committee and not, that doesn't exist everywhere. So we're very fortunate here. There's still more to do. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing a BC build so that people, one of the biggest challenges is getting workers to fill positions, really necessary positions. And they're all, not all low, paying jobs but they can't find a place and there's never been this uh, um, environment that, that, that would facilitate the building of rental stock. So things are changing now. Things are changing now because of marketplace, because of the rules that we're putting in place so that, that we can see more uh, housing built that's, that's going to be affordable. You can't pay, do a down payment so we need rental stock for that. Do we want to see um, housing that uh, doctors can live in, nurses can live in, uh, outreach workers? And, and in, in, in doing that, we're hitting the full range of housing. We're building housing and shelter for people who uh, are living on without a home right now. Uh, we need to continue to do that. We need to continue to provide all of all of the range of housing to help, and we need to be. We've, we've got other programs in place too to help people to build affordable housing, like a, a secondary suite. You can get a forty thousand dollar forgivable loan um, to to put in a, an affordable rental suite, and we've we're fast tracking the way that development permits are are given out so that people can build them more affordably. And we have a great local government that, uh, uh, lo local governments who are, are quite ready, willing and able to make sure that they can, they can see the kind of development that's going to provide for a stronger community. There's so much more that I could talk about. There's such a big list of things that need to be okay, done. We're continuing to do it. We're going to move on to Sorry. the next question. Um, the next question comes to us from the Comox Valley Seniors Support Society. I can society. try. So here's the question. A significant number of people, including children, youth, adults, and seniors in the Comox Valley, do not have equitable access to many activities or services. In June of 2021, the provincial government passed the Accessible BC Act. This requires local governments and organizations to take action on accessibility in communities across BC. If elected, what will you do to work with all people with disabilities in our community and with local governments or organizations to achieve accessibility and universal access for all members of our community? Okay, what will I do? <laughs> I know that when I first moved here to the Comox Valley, there was a, a disability committee uh, that worked out of the Lewis Center. And that was an easy access to, to, to um, connect with the disability community. And it doesn't, that has had ebbs and flows. And one of the things that we have done in terms of the accessibility uh, strategy is to have an advisory group so that there is that voice 
as a government, we have made a point of having um, job one, having proper public consultation on almost every initiative that's, that that's we put forward, and having that opportunity to uh, hear from people. Nothing without, nothing for us without us, and uh, that's. The, that is our mantra and that is the way that we would we continue to serve. The Social Development and Poverty Reduction Ministry came to town for uh, to have workshops as we were developing the strategy and the legislation and that will continue. Um, I know that there's opportunities further to to support local disability groups and that that would be something that I would definitely be pushing for. Parliamentary Secretary for Accessibility is very keen to come to communities and uh, if she is re-elected and gets an opportunity to serve in that role again, I'll we'll definitely be bringing her to have those, those, those conversations about what people are looking for and how we can achieve that. Post-secondary is a, an area where we have opportunities to support people with disabilities to, to um, gain the education that they want. There are programs already in place, but that's, that's another area that we can certainly be um, improving uh, the opportunities. The issue around employment, we were talking about this actually earlier in the, in, in the other group around uh, employment opportunities and how we can make sure that we are giving those opportunities to people to, um, to gain employment, to find uh, employers. There's a, uh, professionals, I forget what they're called, uh, professional employers. There's some, uh, a group, a really strong group who is very supportive of, of opening up uh, employment opportunities for people with disabilities and they are part of that advisory group to, to make sure that, that we are seeing uh, seeing it on the ground where, where people are actually able to engage how they can, when they can and to their fullest abilities. But I know that somebody wanted to know about asking questions so I should maybe make a t point of taking a break and seeing if you had questions. No, not on this one. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I don't know what... Um, I see Bob is sitting here and he's done a lot in terms of, uh, <laughs> of working with people with disabilities and employing them. And uh, maybe you have some ideas that you would like to see. Um, into, say, you know. <laughs> well, well, and that's the thing, it's you, have, you have to be open to, to know, for, for people to know they can come and talk about those things that they would like to see happening in their community and how we can make it happen. If there are no questions on this question, can I ask a question about the previous question? Absolutely. I was wondering if you know, when you say affordable housing, I feel like it's a catchphrase, like what is an affordable house to the NDP government that someone, a family, can buy? And do you know what the average rent in Cobox right now is for a two-bedroom unit or those new buildings that are renting? Like, do you know what the rent per month is? And do you think that is an affordable, affordable monthly income based on the income of our population? Right. Because if we keep building these rental units that no one can afford these rents, is that still affordable housing? So do you know what the rent is going for for a two-bedroom unit in one of those new bills, like either by Superstore, there's the new one on Fifth, there's the Mission Complex, um, on Mission and like Lurwick. I mean, it's almost done. Yeah. <laughs> so you can even just let yeah, I don't know what the rents are. They are, we did not build them. They are marketplace rentals. That's and that's like home lots, right? So you should know what's kind of going on in the community. Well, I know. Well, and Bates, I'm going to ask you to wrap up your final sentence. And we'll begin the next question right away. Okay. <laughs> so this question comes to us from Home Lots Valley Substance Use Collaborative, which is operated by the Indigenous Women Sharing here in the Valley. There has been a lot of conversation in the media about the recent announcements of plans to increase in voluntary treatment for those with acute mental health 
and substance use disorders, which many experts do not support as the evidence shows poor rates of success. Further, there are often harms for human rights violations to higher risk of death from the unregulated drug supply. Do you support involuntary treatment? And if so, how will you ensure it to be effective, evidence-based, that it will minimize harm and will provide long-term success for patients? Okay. Well, this is one of the topics of the day. And I can say that, um, where, to, where to begin on this question? I agree. I know I sat on the health committee that looked at the toxic drug crisis that we have are faced with here in the province. It's also uh, facing communities across North America. And when, when we heard from experts, when we heard from people with lived and living experience from all over the world, uh, experts as well as our people at home, um, it was clear that the evidence is is that people, it is a chronic relapsing condition if you have a drug addiction, and the chances of you overdosing after treatment is quite high. In fact, most people who die, die after they've had treatment, when they come out. We have a candidate here today whose, whose son had that very experience, and it is, it is real and it is a challenge. What the proposal that has come under fire here is a secure care system that we are talking about from the, as, from the BCNDP for a very select uh, group of people, people that have severe drug addiction, who have mental health issues, and who have brain injuries from their anoxic um, uh, conditions from overdosing so many times. It has made communities unsafe, not because all people who are, have mental health issues or who are drug addicted are violent, but there is a select few who are. And what we've been doing hasn't been working. And so, we. Premier David Eby hired a scientific advisor in Dr. Daniel Vigo, and he came back, and then he was hired in June, and he came out uh, with this proposal for people who have behavioral challenges that 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 make them a danger to themselves and to others, and he has he has created this pathway that we that we can take to help people get stabilized and to take them to a place where they can get the help that they need when they can't help themselves. So that's the, that's the intention of it. Uh, there are, are, the first beds are going to happen in, um, on prison grounds but not in a prison. People who are in prison are also um, are dying and it's not that it, they are, uh, you know, put, a, put someone in prison and they'll be fine, then, then that'll be the end of it. It's not at all. Um, we've got other places that are, are going to be rehabilitated for this secure care. And it is not about um, curing somebody with the treatment, it is about helping them get stabilized so that they can move into other treatment if, as, as, ne as needed for a very small, segment of population. We're talking right now about 400 beds. We already have in place uh, the requirement for an advocate within the healthcare system to advise people of their rights, their, their rights around commitment, involuntary commitment. And it is, I, I know someone who's been involuntary committed, and it isn't uh, it isn't the best way forward for, for most people, but for some people it's going to be something that will help them, help people in the communities to be more supportive and so that we can move forward. Yes? So if I understand correctly, you 
you have one facility right now at the Surrey Free Trial, is it like, just saying that this is going to be a trial and see how that works and before you like roll out more? I, th I think they're, they're, they will roll out fairly quickly. Yeah, it's not going to be um, like 10 a year. It's, it'll, there, there, are, there are beds that have been identified to be able to be creating that system. Well, I know there's Surrey pre-trial, and uh, that's one of them. There's another one in Maple Ridge. Um, I, I can't remember where the other ones are. Will there be one on the Listen, I don't, pro maybe, maybe right. not, yeah. But that doesn't mean that people from this community wouldn't be able to go there. We want to keep people local, because that's where their supports are, their family and friends. So we are going to ask our candidates to move to the next table, so number one is... I'm sorry, thank you very much for listening, and I'm sorry I didn't get more to time to... Okay, so this next question is a Comox Valley Food Policy Council question. So in Budget 2023, the, province, the, sorry, the province of BC invested $214 million over three years towards school food programs. If elected, how will you support school food programs for students across the province and ensure that both legislative policy as well as funding is available? And supported. Okay. <laughs> well, I, it's one of my points of pride to be able to share uh, yet another program that was first in Canada and is now being followed by by the federal government. The $214 million for the school food programs is, was intended to uh, meet the needs of the children who are, are coming to school hungry and to do it in a non-stigmatizing way. And this particular school district has been really good about doing it in a thoughtful, uh, progressive kind of way where they they looked at, they did a survey to find out where the needs were and then develop programs in those schools where where the need was highest and it, it made it for a more equitable uh, distribution of, of the funding and as well it recognized the um, the skill sets that they had and the, the, the capacity in each of the schools and they were able to build up uh, capacity where it was needed. I'm really proud of, of our school district for being able to do that and I just heard a, uh, an account from a principal how he'd never seen kids who were so excited and intent, intent on coming to school because there was such a good breakfast program. and. Is it enough? We know it's not enough, but it has spurred our federal government to say they will invest in a universal school food program. So the, those federal dollars will start to come into the community to make sure that, that we can provide food in a non-stigmatizing way. There's, I had a conversation with one of the school trustees around how how can you do that? Uh, and there's great innovations that people that work in our school system have, have undertaken to make it work. I was at the uh, Courtney Elementary School a few months ago, an amazing uh, food menu that was out there where kids could, uh, there was like a token system where you went in and you could get a token if you were, could pay for it or wanted to pay for it, you could. If you couldn't or didn't want to, you didn't have the money, then you could still get a token and eat. And so everybody that was in, in need was able to be um, able to access that, that food. Do we want to continue it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was an initiative that we took on when we had that opportunity and there's just no question that uh, Kids learn better when they've had food in their bellies and it helps feed families because it takes off some of the stress at home to be providing that nutrition. So will we continue it? Of course we will. What was the rest of that question? Um, 
I can't find it now. Yeah. I think I've just, I think I've pretty much answered that question. I know that um, we don't have one of the candidates here today, but these are the kinds of programs that I feel are at risk if, uh, if, they, if they form government. This is a, uh, an issue that could be seen as not necessary or not something that, that uh, government should be involved in. As I said today earlier, uh, we are only as strong as our weakest link, so we need to support people who are vulnerable so that they can succeed because when they succeed, we all succeed. Does anybody have any questions? I was, it was suggested I should take some time. Um, how will you be able to look across the aisle with people who may defer? 45 seconds, candidates, 45 seconds. I, sorry, I missed it. Uh, how will you be able to um, work with people on the other aisle who you differ with politically, but you know you relate with uh, to the, uh, personally? How would I work across the aisle yeah. with people? Um, depends on where I'm sitting, I guess. Uh, but it's one of my ways of, be, of acting as a, a, an MLA is to always be open. I'm part of all, candidate, all, all party committees, and it's really important to establish those relationships so you can go and talk to, to the opposition and make space for, those, for an ability for them to come on side. <laughs> All right, the next question comes from the Comox Valley Social Planning Society. It's this one here. And the question is, the 2023 living wage in the Comox Valley is $2202. And we have seen significant increases in the past two years. This burden falls solely on small business owners right now. However, having a decent standard of living is impacted by good public policy such as government income supports, labor market reforms, including increased availability to unionization, and accessible and equitable public infrastructure and services that reduce the cost of living and improve affordability. Please give a specific example of a public policy you will introduce or support to reduce the cost of living and improve affordability. Well, that's, <laughs> that's an easy one today because um, Premier David Eby yesterday announced uh, an affordability measure of um, granting a $10,000 on the basic income exemption. When you do your income tax, there's, a, there's that basic income exemption, and he's raising it by $10,000. In doing that, uh, people as low as uh, just under $23,000 will we'll be able to, to, to gain uh, extra income from that. $500 per person, um, so if you have a big family that, it, that are working, it, it grows. So 1,000 if there's, you've got two working people in the family, 1,500 if you have this. It's, it's money in your pocket that you're, you're going to be able to uh, spend on things that are, are, are you're having trouble making ends meet on. We already have uh, frozen ICBC rates and given rebates. Uh, IC, the, our BC hydro rates have been kept low. Uh, quite lot, some time ago we ended the, um, the um, MSP premium so people don't have to pay for that. We've reduced childcare um, costs and we continue to, to move forward on that for more people. I have a whole list of things that, we've been, that we have been doing and that we will continue to look at the fact that people need to uh, be able to pay the bills and they don't need that stress. Where we can, we will, we will help. If, if, if we don't take those kinds of measures, and we find more people um, losing their homes. Uh, we find people going, to, we just talked about kids going to school uh, hungry. We don't want to be uh, building that kind of a society and we need, we have been building services and, and providing measures of affordability for, for people because 
we're walking alongside of you because you know that people are for, people are what power this this province and my fear is that when we hear about things like health care cuts um, service cuts which has happened in the past that people will not be getting those services if there's another government that comes in that has a very different agenda on on who deserves help and who's who's going to get it uh, when it's um, obvious that when when you invest in people it comes back we have one of the strongest economies in Canada we have low unemployment we have higher wages we have the highest minimum wage uh, people worry about the interest bite uh, but we have one of the lowest GDP to interest rates than in, in in Canada so it is less of a bite and and it is something that we are working hard to create a clean energy future with jobs, well-paying jobs and, and training people to get the skills that they need to, to, to succeed and to make all of us succeed. And in doing that, well, it raises revenues and that allows us to continue to provide the services that people need. You looked like you were going to ask a question. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sure. Um, with my color on the ten thousand dollars, it goes to tax credit on your income tax. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, let me see. I've got a piece of paper. I have that piece of paper on that. Where did I put it? It is t a ten thousand um, dollar, and it will be immediate, like in the when you do your taxes. Ooh. Say that one more time. I was just saying, I, I think that's probably worth about a thousand dollars in your pocket to pay. Yes. Yes, yes. And it's progressive too. It works as, in a progressive way. Uh, so that, like the other, the opposition that's, that's running on the $3,500 scheme, it, it is, it's taking its time to get there and people won't get the impact until 2029 this one will happen right away in when you do your taxes well it it's helping 90 percent of people in british columbia Research indicates that children in their early years can benefit from support, especially regarding their social and emotional wellness. What would you do to further ensure that the mental and social well-being of children and families is being supported in ways that have previously been lacking? I feel like I should give the floor to Joanne. <laughs> um, I know that we've spent a lot of uh, focus for children age 12 and up and in our, in our um, around mental health and well-being as well as physical health and sexual health with uh, establishing foundries all across the province including right here it's run by John Howard Society um, but also when I was visiting there I heard about uh, more kids that's young as seven years old who were um, accessing cannabis and having some problems and it was a that's you know identified as, as something that's there's a gap that we need to find a way to to start to fill um, those those younger kids and I know that we have the early years collaborative there's there's programs with strong start but this question tells me that that we've got a ways to go uh, we keep doing things to, to try and improve uh, opportunities. I was on Children and Youth Committee. I, was like, I say I like, I like these all-party committees because you get to hear from people all across the province. And in that, in, in that piece, uh, one of the things that I made sure we got into the recommendations was that we have universal screening for, for kids by the time they have their their last shot at age 18 months that there are sometimes behavioral issues that can t 
definitely be identified and need to be addressed early on so that they don't go into kindergarten and it's too late to access the, the amazing services that we have at the Child Development Association. I think that's uh, one of the keys uh, is, is, is the, that ability to uh, do early in, earlier interventions so we can have, have more success with our kids because the challenges now uh, are so different. COVID really brought out a whole host of, of challenges that kids are having and we need to be able to address that and we need to, to do it first by recognizing that um, there are those problems and, and that we need to invest in our children. I'm not I'm, I'm really not sure how I can answer that specifically other than to say that uh, I love our Child Development Association. They are, do tremendous work and I'm in constant c contact with them and our Family Services Association. You know, these are, these are organizations in our community that do great work and are the place to turn to to find out what we can do better. And that's what I take to Victoria. Yes? Uh, it was a recommendation of mine, I, whether or not it gets uh, actually implemented and how. There's, some, there's been some real challenges around making sure that we can access, uh, that people can access all the services that they need for their children who have varying needs. It's not just autism. Uh, one of the saddest pieces was how many families we heard saying they wanted the autism diagnosis because then resources would come to them. They had children with FASD, with dyslexia, with other behavioral challenges and our, our commitment is to make sure that we are providing the services that all children need and, and relating it to function and not diagnosis. That's one of the biggest uh, biggest challenges is that we have is, is trying to implement a big change like that in our system and, and to have the confidence of people that they will be served. One thing I'll just add right away, yes. because my friend Darcy is here too, is um, even in a community of our size, sometimes centralized services are difficult for folks to access, so we've been really working to make sure that people in, Bra in Black Creek or in, you know, Betty Bay or wherever, so trying to bring services more out to people and help them feel connected to others in their community as well. So, right. uh, it's not a big ticket item, but it's just really thinking about how we create access for people, even in, even in the community. Our site is a big deal for a family to come from Black Creek to the Child Development Association if they don't have a car. Right, so, right. So, so Joanne is just talking about access but for people who are more far flung from the urban centers and, and All right, candidates, you have an extra moment while I find a correct piece of paper. <laughs> there yeah, you go. yeah, me too. All right, <coughs> next question here. This one is coming from the Immigrant Welcome Center. Uh, the Immigrant Welcome Center's 2003 needs assessment research showed that many immigrants who live here are employed well below the level of their skills and experience. How would your party reduce barriers to employment so that newcomers are not underemployed? Okay, I actually answered this once already. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's I I got a real uh, strong sense of it with the displaced Ukrainians in this past couple of years of people who have come with, and it's true of immigrants always, that they come with these high, high, um, high functioning jobs, you know, engineers, doctors and lawyers, and, and how do they get into, into those fields here in Canada. Now we have some um, reciprocal kind of, that's not quite the right word, um, but uh, um, agreements where, where credentials can be recognized. Um, but 
the, the issue is, is getting through the foreign credentials process. So we have been working very hard, especially um, around doctors and nurses, to make sure that, that people who have those capacities to, to help fill the positions that we are, we are lacking um, of people to fill, is how, how, how can we get them uh, acc accredited sooner. And so we are fast track. We are putting in the resources to the colleges so that they can process faster and also looking at how we can make sure. Because people still want um, the best care that they can get. How do you do that? With, you don't want to compromise the credentialing system, but you can make sure that, that, that people who have those credentials can, can get there faster and it is starting to work. It's part of what's why we've got now 800 new family doctors because part of the, that, those numbers have come from the foreign credentials process. And we know too that language is an issue. It's a, it, it's, it is a, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, that people need language skills to be able to work effectively in, in most jobs. And so I know that we have put in extra funding with the Immigrant and Refugee Settlement Services to help support the language development. And our own Immigrant Welcome Centre has just opened up, they've doubled their space for English language learning. And we gave $85,000 to them to help with that making that accessible. Of course, you know, you need people to be teachers and we have some incredible folks here and that's where you can start to see those trickle things. You know, they need, the immigrants need housing, the workers need housing and we can't get workers here if we don't have housing for them. We also need to find places and that's where community comes in and the generosity of this community is help making it happen. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will, we will see faster success for, for immigrants because we need them. Yes? Um, obviously, immigrants obviously are needed for the economy. They're very important to the economy and they carry out a lot of jobs that people can't get right now. Um, and sadly, there's enough people, not a lot, but there's enough people who don't like even the word immigrant. So how could you help those people realize that these people are also humans and uh, treat them better? Right. Yes, that's, I mean, that is one of the challenges of the day. Is for, I'm going to say, oh, right, this, this young man has, has asked about how we um, overcome a discrimination against immigrants, that they are not taking away jobs, that they are adding to our communities. And I really appreciate that question. It is, it, it is, I think, a question of leadership. We have um, the opportunity to set the tone as leaders that they are welcome, they are, we need them. We are all immigrants at one time. And that's part of it, the leadership piece. And, and that's a risk that we're facing right now because there is, as you said, a wave of, of anti-immigration. We do need to make it successful for them. We do need to be able to provide the affordable housing for them. We do need to make the conditions right for them to succeed. Otherwise, we should not be bringing people in. And that's clear. Uh, we have to do it right, but we have to do it uh, also with compassion and, and with, 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 the, with all of the gratitude that we should have for them coming. Okay, candidates, please wrap up. Um, we're going to go to the next question. How come I so can't find something? The next question comes to us through the Kamatz Valley Pride Society. And this question is, please note four specific actions you will take to support and foster the growth and safety of the trans community in the Comox Valley. Okay. So he wants four specific actions, and I was a little bit challenged by this question. <laughs> uh, they want four specific actions. Um, where'd it go? To, to take, to take, 
I will take to support and foster the growth and safety of the trans community in the Comox Valley. Um, I think that the, the first thing that we need to do to address the issue of safety for trans people in this community is not elect leaders who, who wish to do them harm. And I think that's, that's job one for everybody. Uh, I know that we do have a gender-based analysis uh, lens to all that we do in government. Uh, it's legislated that we are creating space for people to, to be a part of our public service and to be a common face to be seen and not excluded. Same, same for, for um, education, public education. We've talked about uh, SOGI at another table, uh, the, the need to protect everyone, the need to make sure that we have programs in place that, that teach children to be accepting, uh, to celebrate diversity and to not bully and that's what is the the basis of us growing a society that is actually going to be um, more more inclusive and 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 celebrating of diversity at the same time we have to recognize that when hate happens we have to be able to deal with that and there is a is there is an anti-hate helpline where people can Talk, report incidents. It's it's run through uh, United Way that we have supported. So um, people have that opportunity. Now we did an an, an anti-racism data act, which was a whole process designed to make sure that we weren't collecting data in a way to to create legislation, but we weren't creating data, collecting data in a way that was going to do more harm. And it is that uh, basis that we've been able to establish anti-racism uh, legislation. We also have a, kind of a bizarre connection, but it's about the, the colleges. And we've created legislation for protecting the public interest across all kinds of professions. And one of them is uh, around um, Indigenous people in the healthcare setting but it covers everybody and covers trans people so that people can expect no matter what their their identity that they can go and receive health care services and expect and be able to complain if there is a, a, a discrimination so those I don't know how many I haven't been counting <laughs> but that's that's a, that's, those are the kinds of actions that we can take in terms of when it, ha when it does happen. And we also support the um, Not a Bystander program so that when we see bullying, when we see hate, that we're able to stand up. My staff and I just took a, um, a course online, okay, it's a workshop online, just to help us um, identify our own biases and to do some exercises to to try to change because we're none of us are there yet we all we all can do better and so it's those kinds of supports for education for children for for creating space for for people to um, be who they are and celebrate who they are and I don't know what else I can add to that right now, <laughs> but it's, it, is, it is a subject of great controversy right now in this election, and as I said earlier, this is the opportunity that you have to make a difference too, to stand up and, and, not, uh, and not see that take British Columbia go down the path of fear-mongering and hate and the violence that can come with it. TikTok. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. All right, candidates, I'm going to ask you to wrap up, finish up your sentence, please. Yeah. And, and let's celebrate. Let's celebrate each uh, other. Candidates only. <laughs> <laughs> Many
policies aimed at addressing homelessness are not meeting the needs of those most impacted by the housing crisis? How do you plan to meaningful involve, meaningfully involve people experiencing homelessness in shaping policies, programs, and priorities that directly affect them? What strategies would you use to ensure their voices are central in developing solutions? Okay, did everyone hear that, that one? Okay, policies to address homelessness. Okay, um, well, I think that one of the first things that we did as a government was create a, a requirement for local governments to do a, a housing needs assessment so that they could engage with their community and find out what the housing needs are in each community. And in doing that, you're engaging people and uh, finding out what, what, what kind of solutions will be supported in a community. And I know that the Comox Valley has, has been very good about coming forward to, to step up and get that done. And it's a f every five years they have to upgrade it, um, update, update it, not upgrade it, update it, and make sure that uh, it, it is the finger on the pulse of the needs of the community. We're not, um, we're not at a place yet where everybody is housed. Uh, the needs are great, and we know that that runs from people who are living without a home to people who have work here to come to but can't find a home. And it goes from rental to home ownership beyond that, and so how do, we, how do we address those needs? So we find out where the needs are, and then as a government we can work towards building what, what is necessary. And as I've said in other tables, that this is definitely an incredible community. We have great leadership, we have great capacity in our organizations to, to develop and deliver the housing that we need. The Comox Valley Affordable Housing Society came forward with a plan to uh, increase the number of units of affordable housing for seniors and people with disabilities. And we've, the Wache Friendship Centre has put forward uh, 40 units that they will be open in the, by the end of this year. Uh, the Comox Valley Transition Society has has opened 48 units since we've taken government for second stage housing and just recently opened 48 permanent housing units for women and children and diverse gender diverse people who are fleeing violence to move on from second stage housing to those per that permanent housing. That's, th that's just what's happened this past year. We're, we've got the colleges building um, student housing and student family housing, which will free up market housing. We live in a, 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 a free market system and we have to find places where we can insert um, the supports and subsidies that people may need to, to be able to afford a roof over their head. We started off uh, early on in 2018. We were, worked with the city of Courtney and, and did a, a, what was it called? rapid response modular housing with supports uh, at the junction. And it's been a process throughout the province where, where we've recognized that what kind of supports will help, what, how much support people need to be able to stay housed. And we are just recently bought property to build more shelter to have room for extreme weather shelter. Shelter is not the answer to housing the homeless, but it is a step that we need to take when there, when there just isn't enough housing. On top of that, shelter is going to come supportive housing. And then there's room for more growth. Does it resolve everybody's challenges? No, but does it, we, we do work on the idea of we've raised minimum wage so that when people are working that they, they have more money in their pocket to try and help make ends meet. We also need the workers to, to help uh, 
particularly I know that we've had some outreach uh, positions that we s said we would fund but they they were not uh, filled right away and part of it is because of housing and being able to find people that can afford to move here. So we, we have to attack the whole gamut and we have to provide the supports and opportunities to f so that people can thrive. And it all starts with knowing what the community needs. Okay, candidates, time to wrap up that question and we are moving on to the next question. The next question uh, is from the Comont Valley Senior Support Society. Um, and here's the question. Affordable, accessible, and interconnected public transit can address many social issues, including uh, equality and inclusion, climate change, and quality of life. How do you perceive the role and future of public transit? What changes, if any, would you work towards and, or advocate for in public transit improvements in the Comox Valley, Vancouver Island, and beyond? Okay, so transportation. Uh, I remember being on city council when it was being proposed that we that we end public transit was because it was too expensive. And uh, I brought in Michael McClellan, who's blind, and said, you don't want me behind the wheel of a car. And it was sort of, that was the end of that conversation. And um, over the years, just making sure that we have a system. When I first came here, there was no bus system. Everybody had to have a car or find somebody else to give them a lift. Um, there are communities that are like that, so we're, we're lucky that way. BC Transit works um, in a way that works with, with, with regions. So there's there's uh, Mike Zabarski over at the regional district is the, the go-to guy on, on transit issues. But um, I know that we need the, the, the answer to get people into buses and out of their vehicles is to make it uh, frequent and accessible close to you, which means more, more buses more often in all corners. And then there's the, the question of the, the last mile, the ones where it's hardest to get people into, their, into, a, into the practice of taking a bus because of that last mile. And there's, there's different strategies that can work for in different communities to do that. I know I've heard um, the idea of free transit. We have created free transit for kids under 12. Um, I actually did a study for somebody around what we could do to get more people into, into the practice of taking the bus. And the idea was that, that was being proposed was that they have one year of free transit to get into that practice. And I, the research I did around uh, North America said it, it's not what gets people out into into a bus uh, and leave their cars behind. It is actually that frequency and that the, that cl that closeness to to where they want to get when they want to get there. So um, I think that we we need to continue to work to support it. We I know we've put in more funding for a transit hub up at the college and, and, and around the hospital. And creating transit-oriented communities is one way that we're going to, to be more successful over time. I wish, yes? You've had seven years in power to do that already. You look at cancer patients. And it still hasn't come to you. What are you doing to advocate for the interest in terms of improving our well, I think that that is something that I've, uh, I continue to do to, to make sure that, that, that transit, we have a whole active transportation um, section of, of our transportation planning now that, that is bigger than has ever, has ever been seen. So creating opportunities for, for pathways, for, for um, electrified, well, no, scooters and, and bikes and as well as increasing transit. And we are increasing it. It takes time, it takes the right um, concentration of people as well to make it successful. And it is, it is, uh, it is on the way, and it is, it is something that I will continue to support. What, 
more people are buying cars than, than getting on a bus, and we've, we will change that. Yes? Um, two things. Is the transportation that's designed within Comox Valley, is who makes that decision? Is it the regional district? Is it, like, I live on headquarters and there's buses that go right down headquarters once a day. Nobody takes them because it's yeah. once or twice yeah. a day. Yeah. So who makes those decisions on where they're going? Well, they do studies uh, uh, at, at a regional level, and that's, that's where the, the, that regional aspect comes into, into play in the planning of routes and what's... But they, they also sp do public consultation around needs, and it's a question sometimes of just making sure that um, the need is... of is great enough to to be able to justify not that so that m more people are taking it as opposed to taking it away from one place to service another yeah. i got mark which <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> Sorry, I had my hand up for a few minutes. <laughs> program operated by the Indigenous Women Sharing Society. People who use substances and, indig and Indigenous people report to us regularly that they experience systemic racism and poor quality of health care. What will you do to ensure health care workers and law enforcement workers are provided with significant anti-racism training? and monitoring to create culturally safe practices and address the sort of systemic racism and discriminatory practices. I'll just quickly answer your question. The, the question was around the ENN Railway and the First Nations in, interest in, in that. Um, because it is Crown land um, and there have been court cases, the, we, and the federal government has not stepped up, We've given $28 million to First Nations to, to be more involved in that whole process. It is, it is underway. It is not lost. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the question of, at hand, we're talking about health care. Um, there was a report by Mary Ellen terpel um called in plain sight and it specifically addressed racism in our health care system and there were 24 recommendations I think and I know that I was just reading about the involvement of 31 nations in an advisory council on uh, how to address the systemic racism and the recommendations that have come forward are 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 being addressed with um, uh, under that the bill that that the party that's not here tonight was uh, has has been had an open ear to is, is is the Health Professions Act, which is the colleges, and the colleges are set up to be um, the watchdogs of the the public interest over those professions, and within that uh, setting. We, there, there is a requirement for uh, training to overcome the systemic racism that we are seeing, we've seen in the healthcare system. Now, I heard a story, not a story, of somebody's life um, from here in, Co in Comox First Nation that um, is very disconcerting. And we know it's not finished yet, so it's important that um, it, it not be a one and done. It is important that we continue to to fight that that racism. And I know that the health authorities themselves are each tasked with creating uh, that environment that that where where they're educated and that they are uh, overseen to to be seeing that reduction in that in in racism in in the healthcare setting. There's not. Um, I'm sort of, I'm getting tired here, this is getting <laughs> a bit long. Uh, there's, there's a challenge to when you don't see your face. 
in, in the healthcare workers. And so that's another piece that we are addressing was, is making sure that we are equitable and getting the Indigenous people into the prof health care professions and into our health care system so that they can be when you are indigenous and you go for health care, you, you see and can find that trust. Getting, getting to a place of having that cultural sensitivity, getting to a place where um, you, you feel safe, that you will go there for help, is key to, to creating a, a healthier healthier life for everybody so that's that's job one I want to talk a little bit about um, the decriminalization uh, exemption that we got for subs the possession of substance use it's really important that the police were trained and there was a requirement for them to be trained to reduce that stigma and to be understanding and to be able to share information so that that people that the law enforcement officers could pass on opportunities for making the connections to seek help and there's always that opportunity to um, make complaints but it has to be through an indigenous lens that that it's a safe place to to seek redress when something goes wrong and it's a, it's a challenge for all of us, not just the healthcare workers, but for everyone to say, I, I remember trying to get somebody to get a vaccine during COVID and saying, I'll take, I'll take the COVID shot with you out of the same vial. You know, just those little things that we have to do to make a difference. And with that, we're here on to our last question of um, so this last question comes to us from the Comox Valley Food Policy Council. <laughs> it's been long, it's been long. A lot of the candidates have done this twice today, so way to go. We're almost there. Finishing strong. Okay. The Comox Valley agricultural community is facing several challenges. This includes high land prices, increasing cost of getting inputs to the island, and climate change. How would you support farmers and the local food system? I can answer that one fast. <laughs> so, um, when we were first elected, uh, Minister Lana Popham, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, saw the need to address uh, supporting local farmers um, for sustainability of our farming sector, but also to make sure that we were in a place where we had food security. And the program of, of BIBC had been ditched long ago, but she introduced BIBC, Feed BC, and Grow BC. And the challenges that are mentioned here around um, land prices and the inputs getting the things to the island, um, have have been with us for a long time. We're seeing more and more the the climate change issues that that are that people are facing. But in in the context of making it difficult to farm because people can't afford to get into farming, we've developed a, a land matching program so that farmers can work. Older farmers can work with new farmers to be able to lease land and finding ways so that they can actually make a go of, of farming. I personally think that it's one of the hardest, hardest careers to take on is farming. It's one of the riskiest and it is one of the most necessary and that's why we are taking every effort that we can to support farmers to and to to try and grow the industry because there's so much potential we are a very unique province pockets of different geography separated um, by many miles and mountains and how do we how do we make it successful as a province We've supported regenerative agriculture so that people can um, 
do it sustainably, but also to do it in increasing yields so that, that we're able to feed the people of BC. We saw through the fire, the wildfires way back in 2017, 18, when whole communities were cut off, you needed local food. Um, we support the farmer's market. We've increased the number of coupons that are available for uh, low-income people. And uh, there is there is supports for for farmers to do drought. The environmental management plans, that ag agricultural environmental plans, were a thing of, of um, I remember just starting to see them pop up over time. I worked for an environmental group that, group that was working to try and teach farmers about, you know, saving their, preserving their streams and not de degrading the land and, and helping um, make sure that the environment was, was um, going to be sustainable. And then to see the environmental farm plans coming up all over the place it was very heartening. And now we are at a place where we need to be helping them further around drought and flood. And we have been committed to that and we continue to commit to that because we just won't survive here in British Columbia if we don't help agriculture to survive and thrive. Yes. be subject to ten thousand dollar fines if they use their water without that plastic lining, which is expensive and they say is unnecessary because of the clay makeup of the soil. What, what do you say about that? Yeah, I've heard a few. I don't know about that one in particular. The, the, I mean, every every circumstance is unique when it comes to water, water tables, and. Um, but I have heard about the challenges around permitting and it has been a long process uh, throughout the province. The Sustain Water Sustainability Act was instituted in 2016. It had unanimous support um, in the House and um, in making it real has been a challenge. And, um, water is essential to life and we have to, we have to do it right so that we can make sure it's there for the future for all of us. Well, according to the organic farmer, he says that this makes it extremely difficult for farmers, particularly uh, when we've already experienced an extended drought here before this one. Yeah, I know that one of the one of the um, streams that we have in terms of helping with drought management has is around small community systems and. They have done it in Area C and they're going to do it, uh, hopefully, the next stage. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. <laughs>